okay so good evening everybody i want to come back and uh, thank you all for come coming again and again to this very difficult book uh, uh, it is been a real uh, uh, you know a struggle for me each chapter because it takes hours and hours and uh, to just understand what's the uh, theme that is going through Uh, after it is done it looks easier but it's been tough let me start with the review of chapter number 10 we saw the importance of wisdom with foolishness forming a backdrop so that formed a contrast so we were told about the importance of foolish uh, sorry wisdom uh, with foolishness as a backdrop and uh, we saw nine interesting kinds of fools in the chapter uh, so we could be what that means is we could be wise uh, but at, at the same time uh, we could be foolish because of the warnings that are flagged by solomon in this chapter uh, so the nine category of fools are the wise fools uh, powerful fools wicked fools mindless fools talkative fools inexperienced fools lazy fools rich fools and careless fools wise fool is somebody who could allow small mistakes to mess up their lives their families their careers for example esau moses david judas etc powerful fools are those who cannot uh, get a grip on their emotions or uh, they make errors of judgment because of ignorance or because of their emotional attachments wicked fools are those who could sometimes take steps to harm others or take what is theirs and justify their actions but uh, more frequently uh, they are people who might cross fences fences that we have in the society fences of shame fences of respect fences of social behavior etc without thinking too much about crossing those fences and the consequences attached these are the wicked fools the mindless fools are those who do not skill up tool up or rule up uh if we do not work on our skills and become better we are mindless fools uh if we do not know when to stop talking and if we keep on talking uh, talking in fact keep on boasting uh when we do not even have a grip on the simple things in life we are talkative fools when we get too much too early in life we could end up uh, losing a lot of that in pleasures and merry making instead of doing what needs to be done and that way we could become inexperienced fools lazy fools are those who do not put effort uh, into those things that need that effort and at that time it could be a building it could be a repairing it could be something very serious and uh, you do not put in that effort and you end up being fools just because you are lazy rich fools are those who spend a good percentage of their money in treating guests to banquets and drinks all for acceptance and honor in the society but actually they may be forgetting that they are depleting their own cushion so instead of plowing back into the business uh, they are actually spending these are rich fools you should plow back more and spend less the last category of fool is a careless fool when we are not careful in our thought and speech especially about powerful and rich people uh it may just show off on our attitude and behavior or it may just carry off through somebody we know to these very powerful and rich people and end us in trouble more trouble than we could ever anticipate so this is the review of chapter 10 we will go into chapter 11 chapter 11 is a push towards true wisdom there are only 10 verses but what i saw here are about eight to nine different principles uh which we could keep in mind as we tread through life <coughs> so we will take this verses uh one at a time but probably the uh first second and third verses can be considered as the first bunch and then mostly most of the verses stand alone let me read verse 1 cast your bread upon the waters for you will find it after many days verse 1 says that cast your bread upon the waters it starts with a strange kind of a statement 
who will cast bread upon the waters and expect anything after many days doesn't bread absorb the water and become soggy and spoilt what if we find that bread after many days what use is it even as an idiom this whole statement sounds very weird but uh, there is a deeper meaning to it what it could mean is uh casting the bread upon the waters could mean that doing something with the money that you could use now for eating or something that's more immediate uh not doing that but putting it into something that looks hopeless and risky and uh, whatever yield it might bring to will come after many years so bread it could have been seed because the root meaning does include the word grain but uh, it is talking about bread so it's talking about something that is useful now but you still throw it away and then after many years it comes back the first thing that comes to my mind is it is referring to people who have slightly deep pockets uh see there are businesses like uh, for example the telephone industries or the airlines industries where the initial maybe about 10 years or so you are only putting money into it even online portals like amazon and uh, flipkart uh, they are also businesses where the initial years you don't earn any money you are just going on putting into it and uh, putting into infrastructure putting into expansion putting into marketing and advertising you are just putting in and in and in and there is nothing coming out but after that a break even comes provided those companies survive that time frame and that's why only companies with very deep pockets uh, get into these businesses so something like that is the first inference that we can make that you put your bread what you want today into the waters and after many years it will come back so this, this suggestion is definitely for those who have a good cushion of money with them solomon is saying that some amount of that money should be invested into something that is seemingly hopeless or they should just give away to someone without expecting any gratitude or return from it in the near term it could be the help you give to someone a fund that you wrote off and it should look seemingly foolish so it is a nudge from the critic that the randomness in life can make fun of our intuitions and gut feeling so when we give money to somebody or when we invest we depend a lot on our intuitions and our gut feelings and what solomon says is uh, <laughs> you can't trust your gut feelings and meaning and your intuitions too uh, so uh, it uh, the critics is saying that uh, you should throw away some of your money into something that is very hopeless how much of it is not said but he said some amount of your money should be invested like that but he gives an assurance that after many days it will come back so people who can afford it or can believe in this principle should do it as solomon says if people live long enough they will reap the rewards of their strange actions several years later let me explain the second aspect of it casting your bread upon the waters could also mean uh, a different kind of work than what people usually do so this could mean a silent work or a hopeless work or a thankless and unappreciated work that is throwing bread upon the waters uh silent work means work which nobody notices so you are out there doing something very silently and nobody is noticing it it is like putting bread upon the waters you know we expect some kind of a recognition uh, or adulation from people for the work we do some appreciation always but there is this kind of work in a person's uh, time frame where nobody sees it so it's a silent work uh i think what we should remember is uh that there are a lot of people who turn up to watch the niagara falls it makes a lot of noise and uh, it is very photogenic 
and it is huge there is a lot of hue and cry around it but upstream there could be some small silent streams that flow through the country silently no noise nobody is visiting it nobody is watching it nobody is taking photographs of it but it is silently flowing through the land and making the land fertile so niagara is making a lot of hue and cry but it doesn't make the land fertile what makes the land fertile is the silent work so somewhere the critic is saying that you should not always have your life full of uh, work that is hue and cry there should be some silent work also happening uh, there should be some hopeless work also happening now what do i mean by that uh, there are some kids in our houses or in our classrooms who seem to be a big drain big headache big pain uh, and uh, their parents think that they are uh, spoiling or wasting their money behind this brat uh, their time their energy their resources but sometimes much later in life these very brats turn out to be game changers and suddenly all that investment which looked like a waste has suddenly borne fruit you want to say what now what i am saying now casting your bread upon the waters so sometimes when you invest your money in life you may end up or you may be forced to or you may need to invest in things which are probably silent or which are hopeless which feels uh, like a foolish decision at that time but there is a way in life when sometimes some of these things will turn back and give you greater returns than you expected a third kind of category i said is a, a thankless and unappreciated work sometimes some of the things we do especially if it involves a lot of our brain and heart you know you can't see it if it's a hard work where there's physical labor if there is a lot of movement of materials people see it and say oh, oh, oh so much of work is done but if it is just purely intellectual or emotional activity nothing is moved no work is seen so suddenly you feel that you know nothing uh, happened so it is usually not appreciated but such investments made mentally and emotionally can bear fruit many years later so the critic says that these kinds of works are also required to be done you cannot always uh, invest or do things which attract attention or look like very uh, hopeful and rewarding and have a lot of appreciation attached with it some of your work should be like casting your bread upon the waters and wisdom should help you tell what to do when because they will yield unexpected results after a very long time we will come back to this so verse 1 cast your bread upon the waters is something which i call sack Uh, senseless generosity senseless generosity now we come to verse 2 verse 2 says give a serving to seven and also to eight for you do not know what evil will be on the earth i call it sacrificial generosity so the first one two and three points are on generosity but different kinds of generous generosity the first one cast your bread upon the water this senseless generosity now he is talking about serve seven and also eight give a portion to eight this is sacrificial gener- generosity the advice on generosity continues and now the critic says that if you have portions for seven people then stretch a bit more and give to eight so one of the suggestions is that always give more than what you have planned for if you have planned to give something then always give more than what you have planned for another suggestion could be it could also mean that you anticipated seven people with needs but eight turned up then if that is the if that's the case then do not turn that eighth person away without giving him stretch and give that's why i call it sacrificial generosity so when you have already made up your mind to give do not let anybody go back are uh, dismayed stretch yourselves and do something and in this giving what the critic says solomon says is we might just save someone 
from the repercussions of the evil days that come ahead our act of generosity might just save somebody because it says that we do not know what evil will be on the earth but there is another uh, side of it also see why do we not give why will we not stretch if there is a eighth person who turns up or we only plan for seven and we never plan for eight why is it because we are actually setting apart a little for ourselves a little exa- excess is always kept apart by us for the bad times that come in the future but the critic says uh this this contingency that you have kept for the bad times how can you be sure that the future will not hit the contingency itself i mean we do not know how that contingency might hit us what if that evil comes and eats away the contingency fund for example what if the bank in which you kept the money goes kaput you're no no longer able to access that money or what if the value of the land or the gold fell to the ground and you could not do anything it could be in the share market so sometimes see that's where pushing pushing into a territory of unknown is what the critic is doing see uh there there are things you you feel are hopeless and there are things in the future which you are calculating for i mean all this all your calculations might be useless is what he's saying he's saying that if today's need is generosity if today somebody needs to be given something and you have something for it though it is earmarked for something else he is saying that so setting aside generosity today in the name of provision for the future might be foolish says the critic now we go to the third suggestion on generosity it is painless generosity so verse 1 was talking about senseless generosity phase 2 uh, verse 2 about sacrificial generosity and verse 3 about painless generosity now here he says that if the clouds are full of rain they empty themselves upon the earth now when is the cloud going to rain when it is full when it has more than its capacity of water the critic says that those who have enough and more of funds with them should sometimes engage in an outpouring of their abundance like the clouds pour out rain if your cloud is full you are not given that excess so that you will float around like a cloud with all that moisture it is given for outpouring that is something we need to understand we feel that all the money we get in our hands is for us sometimes it is like the clouds the the moisture is there in you so that you will go at some place on the earth some location and you will pour out and bless that place clouds are a sign also of gloom and pain and sorrow on the earth but only as far as they remain clouds so you know we say that uh, there are dark clouds are surrounding us uh, it, it is to point out that uh, uh, my times are tough but that's precisely what happens when people store up money and do not give it out it is dark times for a lot of people so our storing up a lot of funds is actually like a dark cloud not allowing light to shine on the earth not allowing life to happen on the earth in fact lot of thunder and lightning falls on the earth so people who have money and do not give out are like doubt dark clouds creating a lot of gloom and despair to a lot of others however if they pour out they become a blessing the pouring out will never hurt the clouds they will continue to be clouds only thing is they are not dark clouds now they are white clouds however it adds life and hope to those who receive the rain however the looming dark cloud can make things bad on the earth so you decide says that this is a painless generosity for the cloud it is nothing but it gives a lot of blessing to those who are at the other end and it ends in chapter 3 uh, verse 3 saying that uh, if a tree falls to the south or the north in the place where the tree falls there it shall lie the critic talks about the tree to assert that all generosity is possible only as long as you are alive once we are gone we will remain at the place where we fell that means 
however we were at the time of our death is how we will be remembered if it was north north if it was south south if you are generous generous if you are non generous non generous now let me sum up this whole generosity thing one two three points senseless sacrificial and painless generosity in all the three examples of generosity above there is an advantage for the one who is generous also in the first case he will get the reward of his uh, seemingly foolish and strange action many days later so at the time he might least expect it his generosity will pay him a return visit and it is possible at that time that things have changed for him and that bread that came back might become a blessing in disguise sometimes things we do now we may not realize uh we may think that it was a waste or we may think that it was a useless investment or i put a lot of time in that guy but it never helped but you know many years later it may come back as a surprise i let me tell you from my life there have been countless examples of people in whose life i have invested and it felt like a vain exercise at that point of time because they themselves would have made fun of us ridiculed us but years and years later they came back they came back uh, and uh, this whole concept of bread throwing on water oh my god it's it doesn't mean that all your bread should be thrown on the water mind you but there are some things in your life which should look a little outlandish but it will definitely give you results much later in the second case the generosity will help uh, many people and even the person himself to get through the evil days so many days evil days and then the last the third case is generosity will decide how he will be remembered because his act will help many get over with their sad days and he himself uh, in that pouring out you know Uh, giving is much more joyful than receiving and a person who gives off from his excess and doesn't feel that pain uh, will definitely feel the joy in it god uh, will never let him go without being blessed so there is a there is a blessing in the giving so we talked about many days evil days and sad days generosity helps for all these days now let me go into the fourth verse so this brings in the fourth principle from chapter 11 he who observes the wind will not sow and he who regards the clouds will not reap so remember these are pushes towards true wisdom and it is pushing us towards territories unknown okay keep that in mind now he says do not look at the winds and the clouds there are there are people who keep looking at the winds and clouds to decide what is the right time to go out and sow the seeds so if it is too windy they might refrain if it is too cloudy they might not reap what the critic is saying is that things need to be done at a first favorable opportunity or at a time that it is it is expected to be done in the case of sowing there is a season for sowing and reaping so for example wheat it has to be sowed in the first week of december i'm talking about gujarat uh, it has to be sowed in the first week of december whether it is raining whether it is windy you don't look at it it has to be sowed at that time so that it can be reaped in the first week of april irrespective of how the winds and the clouds are they need to be done without looking around too much but if you keep analyzing and waiting for the best time you might even lose what you are supposed to get now when you when you get down to your work you will see a lot of winds and clouds they might be indicators of a bad time in fact they might be the uh, indicators of difficulties in the work but things could get worse for you if you wait for them to get better so the critic says difficulties in the normal things you do in life should be expected don't wait for them to go you just go and do it and you depend on the providence of god when you take a step and do what you have to and you overcome those difficulties and you move on you will find results you will not waste that effort 
over analysis is usually an indication of disbelief or disobedience or idleness or rebellion or guilt or being miserly i mean i could explain this but i'm not going into the details but people can just uh, you know, not do what they are supposed to do by over analyzing situations now even in your own lives you may be not taking decisions because you are over analyzing every variable and constraint the critic says don't over analyze if you are lo- going to look at winds and clouds you will never be able to do the right thing so sometimes when we have to take a decision for christ that should i accept christ as my lord then we look around and we wait for the right uh, wind and the right clouds and the right climate sometimes we wait for the right too many things to fall in place but the randomness of life and the uncertainty of death and the march of time force us to refrain ourselves from over analyzing too much if something has to be done it has to be done and you know we say that in hindi shub kaam mein deri kya you know then why so we do not look for whether it is the whether the stars are in place whether uh, uh, you know the favor of the family is there with us or not or whether the government will favor us or not it has to be done it has to be done those who wait for the wind will not sow and those who regard the clouds will not reap and especially in the cases of taking a decision for the lord waiting for the right kind could be disbelief and disobedience so and rebellion and it could leave you guilty that's why i used all those words there uh, so be careful do not over analyze so we looked at four points so far senseless generosity generosity sacrificial generosity uh, painful generosity and now we looked at uh, useless over analysis now let's go into the fifth principle coming out of chapter number 11 verse 5 as you do not know what is the way of the wind or how the bones grow in the womb of her who is with child so you do not know the works of god who makes everything now so far he was pushing us into the unknown now he brings the guy who is in the unknown and that's god and he brings him into the forefront uh, and he says see there are some things that only god will know there are so many things that we do not know of because we cannot see them we do not see them because they are not in the visible realm we do not see the corona virus or we do not know what will happen in the future we cannot see the future so those kind of things definitely only god will know but there are many things in the visible realm too which we see but we will never understand here itself the critic says that we will never know how the spirit comes into a man it could be even interpreted as wind so even wind you know we will never know where the wind comes from and where it goes then he says we, we will never know how the child in the womb develops bones so the you know the 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 uterus is full of fluids the amniotic fluid and then this uh, baby starts forming inside this just a cell and then it is slowly becoming a little uh, uh, you know mass of flesh but how does it get uh, solid bones out of all that liquid and flesh all that is surrounding the baby inside the womb is just liquid and and flesh then how does it develop bones so i i know the answer is it's is there in the dna but how it happens you know for uh, the person like solomon who was alive 3000 years ago it was a big question how does the baby get bones inside the uterus who puts the bones there is a question but even in today's time we can still be in awe of how that happens and we do not know god makes it happen it is stored in the dna we know that but still it is a wonder so there are several things in life that will remain mysteries so we should know that and there are some things that we will never understand we should accept that 
so we will need to know someone who understands everything that's the point the critic brings the critic says god is behind everything and there are some things that only he understands so therefore you will need god on your side to take care of these things that we will never know about some of things may appear like natural things and they are not accidents and all that uh, but god is behind it god is behind everything so the critic says that one of the principles for true wisdom is that we should recognize that we need god so senseless generosity sacrificial generosity painless uh, generosity and then useless uh, over analysis and then the need of god let's look at the next one so you will see that uh, these are all very very practical suggestions coming from solomon and i am sure that they will be useful for you when you look at your lives in uh, verse 6 he says in the morning sow your seed and in the evening do not withhold your hand for you do not know which will prosper either this or that or whether both alike will be good what is he saying he is saying that diversify your sources do not depend on one thing it is a very prudent uh, financial uh, advice that people give for those who have money that you you should diversify your investments or you should diversify your business because if you put it put all your eggs in one basket you are actually endangering yourself so that is the same suggestion that's coming forth here do not depend on one thing so there are things we do in the morning we should not be content that because we do that in the morning it will take care of us if there are things that we do in the evening we should not or i mean if there are things we can do in the evening we should not turn those opportunities down because the morning activity might become affected by the randomness of life the mornings and the evenings here do not necessarily mean a full time job and a part time job so don't start thinking in those directions it could be that but it could also mean various seasons of a year or it could even mean the various seasons of your life so sometimes we may be happy having planned everything for retirement and too much dependence on what we have earned could be a miscalculation life is too unpredictable so keeping in mind the randomness of life what the critic says if an opportunity comes for you to do something post retirement or if there are options that open up for you even now for post retirement you should do it you should plan for it you should start aiming for it the morning could also mean the things you are good at and the evenings could also mean things you are not so good at but you still get opportunities to do it so i don't know how you will look at it what is your morning and what is your evening you find out the whole crux of what the critic is saying is that do not over depend on one thing you should diversify so the critic is not saying about engaging yourself in work all day the example of the morning and evening is only taken for us to understand that we should diversify our dependence and not put it all in one thing that would be foolishness let me go to the next principle next principle is in verse 7 he says that truly the light is sweet and it is pleasant for the eyes to behold the sun what is the critic saying here that you should aspire for light because it's a sweet thing there is nothing as good as light now what does that mean keep looking at the light no what it means is much deeper and uh, let's look at it light in any form is beneficial artificial lights our bulbs uh consider a small light in a jail uh a night light on the street a uh, light that you see far away when you are on a highway it it gives you some kind of a joy the light from the lighthouse for the ship it it tells it which direction to take it it is a landmark on the sea 
so light in all its form is a matter of joy and hope artificial life definitely gives a lot of hope in a small cottage in the jungle for the lady living inside the cottage that that light is not just hope it is also company so artificial light is beneficial then let's look at natural light natural light helps us see it helps us appreciate beauty it keeps us away from obstacles it keeps at bay the dangers of the dark it brings life into the world photosynthesis and the oxygen and stuff like that it takes away fear and brings joy so natural light is beneficial then light can also mean intellectual light what does intellectual light do it enlightens reasoning it enlightens judgment it helps us gather information store it arrange it amplify it it uh, helps us how to use it uh, it helps us to review and recall and revive and also helps anticipate the future so intellectual light also is beneficial then there is scriptural light because we say that the lord your word when we raise up the bible and say ye mere paon ke liye deepak hai mere raah ke liye ujala hai it's a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path it keeps us in the way of righteousness what is right in the eyes of god it helps us understand god it helps us understand holiness it helps us understand sin it helps us understand salvation it helps us understand need for salvation it shows us the way of salvation scriptural light is beneficial it leads us to jesus and through jesus to eternal life then we need spiritual light why it is different from scriptural light spiritual light is actually the light that shines out in a dark heart and that changes its heart it is the light that shines out in a in the mind of a person and leads him to repentance it helps a person to value the softer graces of mankind like grace and mercy and and uh, goodness in character kindness gentleness it all comes from that spiritual light that shines inside of a man so spiritual light is beneficial and then there is eternal light the light of god that we will dwell in forever even eternal light is but so light is beneficial in all its form and a man should aspire for all these kinds of light he should always aspire for any of these kinds of light it is sweet and there should be no end of seeking for this life for this light it is the best thing to do when you are alive it is the best thing to do so uh talking about the intellectual the scriptural spiritual eternal always keep seeking light in a day or in the course of our life we will always naturally move away from light into darkness our inclination will be always into shadiness and into darkness so we will always have to push ourselves into the light and we always have to aspire for light so that's the suggestion from the critic so the first one was senseless generosity second was sacrificial third was painless generosity fourth was useless over analysis fifth was the need for god sixth was diversify your sources and the seventh was aspire for light now we come to the eighth principle coming out of this chapter and it is in verse number 8 it says that if a man lives many years and rejoices in them all yet let him remember the days of darkness for they will be many all that is coming is vanity a man may live long years and he should aspire to rejoice each day of his life he should not let one day pass even the bible tells us very clearly this is the day that the lord has made let us rejoice and be glad in it we should not cannot waste a day that's why the bible says rejoice always and again i say rejoice it's very difficult teaching for us to follow so we should aspire and plan to rejoice each day of our lives but 
we should at the same time also expect that dark days will be a part of this life and we cannot escape them and in fact the critic says that the number of dark days will always be longer than the happier ones but if we already know that in advance then it will help us uh keep the shadow of gloom from influencing the happier days that we live when we know that the essence of our life is going to be or the majority part of our life are going to be dark and there is only some part of it which will be really a matter of joy and rejoicing but we already know that then it is easy to factor in and actually rejoice when the good days come so when we desire for long life uh do not think that all that you get in that long life will be good days majority of the long life that you get might be uh dark days but still you know it's so strange that even if a majority of our life is darkness nobody wants to die why because we know the dark days are better than death it is better to be alive in the dark days of our lives than to be dead so if that is so then let us do everything possible to stay away from eternal death dark days will come expect darkness in our lives that is wisdom you have to be ready for it so that brings me to the last two verses of chapter number 11 it says rejoice o young man in your youth and let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth walk in the ways of your heart and in the sight of your eyes but know that for all these god will bring you to judgment therefore remove sorrow from your heart and put away evil from your flesh for childhood and youth are vanity we will we are seeing a critic who is now very solidly and very strongly bringing god into the picture and uh, chapter number 12 which is the last chapter is going to uh, bring meaning into this meaningless life this vanity by introducing god and it begins by saying that uh, this god needs to be sought after much early in life you cannot wait for uh, old age to find it now for that he says that there is nothing better in life than youth there is nothing better to do in life than rejoicing so a young man should choose to rejoice and decide to let his heart to cheer this is allowed for him it is okay for him but he should remember he should not forget that there is a judgment that he will have to face so if there are lines that he will cross if there are things that make him liable for judgment the critic says he will not escape it god will call you for judgment for everything you do see actually young people are quite daring and do not worry about consequences so much as the older people older people are much more careful you know uh, those who are burnt by the milk are also going to blow the uh, the chas and drink it uh, so older people are much more careful but young are very very daring because they see a lot of life ahead of them so they they go dekh lenge we'll 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 sort it out the critic gives a sure warning that young people cannot escape man may miss it justice systems on the earth may miss it but nothing escapes the eyes of god god will see it and you will be judged the problem is that uh the young men will face great difficulty in resisting to do what their heart desires and their eyes ask for and that's why the warning judgment expect judgment so that's the ninth principle expect judgment and verse 10 ends by saying that take necessary corrective action so that you escape needless remorse and pain in eternity so these are the nine principles uh, coming out very strongly in uh, chapter number 11 first three points are about generosity 
it is wise to be generous uh, you should engage in some senseless generosity you should engage in sacrificial generosity stretch yourselves and you should also engage yourself in painless generosity then it says that you should not over analyze don't keep calculating do what you have to and he says you need god there are some things that only god knows and he says diversify your sources do not depend on one thing then aspire for the light all your life and then he says that expect darkness it will help you to steer through your life much more uh, confidently and joyfully and also expect judgment be careful god is watching you every day these are steps towards true wisdom so we could have we could see very evidently that the critic so i'm concluding the critic is heavily bringing in god into every equation or the characteristic of god is brought into consideration in the argument after considering all aspects he finds god as the safest bet for man so he he is now down to considering god we considered so many things right but he is now considering or or he has actually considered and is offering god as the solution god knows everything and his hand is behind everything so live and walk in a way that his hand will be with you so that's the end of chapter number 11 thank you god bless you